Hello, welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here with Peter Yarrow of Peter, Paul, and Mary fame. Peter, as many people know, has written and wrote one of the best songs, one of the most well-known songs of all time, Puff the Magic Dragon. But what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of that came from his time at Cornell University. And so we're going to start by talking about Peter Yarrow at Cornell University. Welcome. My brother, Steve. Well, my brother we have Peter, a little bit you. of history, folks, so you just know we're, we're buddies. Full disclosure. <laughs> Well, full disclosure, you and I did not go to Cornell together. No, we did not. I'm uh, 40 years older than you are. <laughs> um, well, can we, can we talk about Cornell? Um, so why well, did... Let me put it contextually, because it's a wonderful subject, but it's actually the topic you have lit upon is really the key to our survival. Uh, and I have to frame it in the following ways. Uh, when I was at Cornell, I started out as a physics major because I had gotten the physics prize at the famous High School of Music and Art in New York where you didn't take an academic exam, and yet it was the third highest academic school in New York. Yet all the people there simply either showed their portfolio of their uh, paintings, or they played an instrument, or they sang. It was an environment of such beauty, such heart. We did two extra periods a day of uh, our, our major, and uh, I, unbeknownst to you until this moment, was an art major. <laughs> I did know that actually. Oh, you did? I know. did know. That. I did know. I, d I knew that you were an art major, but I also know that you played uh, some instruments as well. Yes. Well, folk music was all around, and I had studied the violin when I was very, very young. And uh, it was ide idyllic. This society. It was. Uh, we had a larger percentage of. Puerto Rican and black kids than any of the other top schools, a very large percentage. And it was, we were in love with that experience. People will tell you who were there and still go there to what is now called LaGuardia, which combines the two fame schools. Fame being a, both a film and a, a television show. And it was there that I saw, experienced, and embraced a way of life that became a model for what I wanted to experience again in various ways in my life. Because the creativity that surrounded us was an us thing. And because music, allows you to participate only if you're willing to offer your heart and soul to it. So there's a certain vulnerability involved. Once people aren't walking around with masks and walking around with protective attitudes, uh, and, and you don't if you've got uh, this kind of uh, environment with the creative arts. And it was very progressive. You know, uh, and so then I, my mother being a school teacher, I uh, got into Cornell. I didn't get into Yale, but that was not unusual in those days. Uh, uh, I, I was, at Cornell famously took a lot of Jewish kids. And I was one of those Jewish kids. And I got what was called a, a, a Regent State Scholarship and a Cornell State Scholarship, which meant that more than half of the cost of my going there, which was half the cost was 1250 2500 for the whole year. And with that, and washing dishes at fraternities, you know, here I, I had a path at an Ivy League school. Well, I got there, 
And to my horror, which was the same horror if you had gone to Yale, if you'd gone to Harvard or Penn, University of Pennsylvania, or, or even, and that didn't have to be Ivy League. To my horror, the, the, the insensitivity, the misogyny, the racism, the hyper-materialism, the cruelty uh, that, that was accepted, you know, just the hierarchy of the hazing and the fraternity. I remember in the freshman dorms when these two uh, uh, fraternity guys came by <laughs> and they looked at my guitar on the wall and some paintings and they, they looked in and they said, oh, we must be in the wrong room. Literally, that was, that was, the, I was what you called then a quintessential turkey. A turkey is not a nerd. A nerd has some qualities and, and uh, capacities and some stature in today's world. A turkey was an outcast. And here I had been ecstatic at the High School of Music and Art. I'd been, in my second year, I had been uh, secretary of the school general organization. And I was ecstatic and I was, I was just miserable. I to see that women, there were four, about four Cornell, uh, uh, what they call them, four male, uh, Cornell men to one co-ed. And uh, the women, Cornell co-eds were pursued strategically for romantic exchanges and uh, the currency was fraternity pins, and uh, if you were African American, nobody would look at you, let alone speak to you, unless you're running down the field with a football in your hand and scoring a goal. And it was all about how you dressed, how wealthy your father was, your mothers didn't exist, and the, uh, the patronizing, subjugating way in which the Cornell men felt about and spoke about the co-eds was, it was very, it, it, it was the way it was, but it was to me, because I'd been at this wonderful school, it was just perfect. So I went to see the psychologist by the name of Dr. John Summerskill. And then I, uh, he became the president of San Francisco State at a later time. He was terrific. And I said, look, what am I going to do? I, I hate it here. I hate being here. I, I'm totally, totally not suited to be in this environment. I am in, in the happiest hell, but I want a really good academic uh, education. I ultimately was to graduate with a degree in experimental psychology. Uh, when I realized that I, I would not be <laughs> a meaningful, let alone great physicist. So uh, he said, you know, Peter, you're right. Your observations are right. It was just a very courageous thing for him to say. This is the reality that we have in our lives at this time is not a healthy one. It's, it's not a good one. And I believe that you should stick it out here, as I know you would like to, and I believe this will even make you stronger in terms of your efforts to make the world the kind of world that you, you have as a vision for the future, which, of course, was epitomized by the High School of Music and Art. Now, I was a turkey, as I said, and then an odd thing happened. 
because I, over the years, I became the president of the folk song club because I did sing folk songs. And in that capacity, I was asked to have an undergraduate instructorship at Cornell in the one class that had a, an instructor under a professor, in my case, Professor Harold Thompson, and of course, in folk ballads and uh, folk, uh, et cetera, who was an undergraduate rather than a graduate student. And I'd take attendance and I'd mark papers, but, and I'd also sing songs to illustrate the child ballads. I'd learn them and I'd sing them. But this course had one thing that was very famous. It was the quintessential gut course. Every pre-med took it because it was an automatic A if you came there, pretty much. And on Saturdays, we would just sing. We, there was no class. And the singing was astonishing. Because when they sang together, the music that they came out of their throats was so beautiful and so compelling. And, they, and the environment changed from this hypercharged, hyper uh, competitive, uh, better born, uh, snotty, uh, uh, prejudiced, biased, hyper materialistic, fame seeking, whatever, into people who just open their hearts. Because when you sing, it, it's, it's a, a more connected to the reptilian brain or to the emotional part of your, um, whatever your systems are, rather than to the logical pieces. And it is uh, famously, at this point, a a physiological reality that it engages singing together engages yourself so that something extraordinary happens in your in your body so this is what happened all of a sudden people started coming like crazy it was the largest lecture hall in the campus and there was 350 people and all of a sudden we were getting a thousand people cramming out in the hall singing and the, New York, uh, the Cornell Daily Sun had an article, and I said, I know what I'm going to do with my life. I see that this music humanizes people, that this music creates community, that this music... And now I just went back, believe it or not, for my... Was it the 50th or 60th? I graduated in 1959, whatever it is. I'm 81. And I go up there, and the people that I, and I'm singing a concert for the folks, and they come, and some of them said, you know, that was the most important experience that I had at Cornell was being in that class. Now, what does this have to do with the questions that you are inquiring about? Here it is. We live in a world in which, as we sit here, we might as well be fiddling because Rome is bursting into flames any moment. If we accept the science, which Greta Thunberg has down from Sweden, we have only a certain amount of carbon to use up before we're in a cycle of deterioration of the environment that is unstoppable. And 10 years ago, uh, we had 60% more than we have now. We've only got 40%. We've got eight years by her calculation if we continue on that route. Now, what happens when you've got um, people who are displaced because of war in, in, 
in Syria or in Afghanistan or they they try and migrate someplace they they're boat people they're whatever and all of a sudden we see that the reality of this displacement from war and and conflict has done something it's created a scapegoat in many countries to which people are trying to uh, to uh, to migrate uh, and it opens up the route for a strongman or a totalitarian to harness the fear that can be mobilized of those people because the Nazi playbook needs three things it needs a, um, a scapegoat it needs uh, uh, to inculcate fear as the operative word and it needs to control the information to the people who subscribe to and embrace that point of view and now we see in Hungary and we see in Italy, we see France, the emergence, we see whatever we see in the United States. And now let me tell you, almost at the finish of this, because I'm getting to the role of education. We even see just now that in uh, the Caribbean, now what's that? Oh, that's called climate refugees. Can't get in. And what happens is that you've got, you know, surges of hatred, strong men, totalitarian kinds of governments are emerging, and the, the, the resolve to keep people in. What happens when 100, 200, 300, 500 million people are displaced? Okay? There's no way to stop this. How are we going to address this? If you accept the premise that this is inevitable, how are you going to do it? Education. Because if we can educate the hearts of our, of our young people now, in ways that we have not been, where we cut out the music, cut out, but focus on social emotional learning, the evolution of the character, the humanity. If we do that, then we, and, and for me, all you have to do really is suffuse the school in, in, in the arts. And that'll get you a long way. But you really have to consciously say, look, doing this is not just making us happier. Yeah, we may be a little less competitive in terms of 21st century uh, advanced skills of some sort, but survival itself will be dependent on one thing, the creating of a sense of community, that we care about each other, that's more important than saying, so that when the, the, the people are at the border, and they want to get in instead of saying, we're going to meet you with guns and we're going to get into our shelters and we're going to have... No, we say, we don't have all that much, but we must survive together. To make that shift, there is no way to do it without looking at the education, not just in, in elementary school, high school and college. And the dramatic experience that I, that I sh shared in my high school years versus what Cornell was. Now, I have to say, Cornell is not like that now. But it's not not like that also. It is not, and none of the schools are, and none of our institutions. And we have a culture in our world that has an increasing black hole of empathy and compassion if we do not understand that we have to look what if we had the Pope the Dalai Lama 
the, the uh, chief Arval looking horse, uh, uh, indigenous leaders, the Roman uh, Catholic uh, 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 Muslim Mas uh, Imam, Imam, and they all the leaders said, "Be nice." Well, no, who, who cares? You know, be nice, love each other, compassion. Yeah. If you make it very clear to people that they need to have an epiphany, come to realize that we must protect ourselves from destroying the environment and the next generations in ways that are just beyond the beyonds. We might be able, but that's not the only way. The other way is to talk about it to talk about what education is. Why do I say this? About 20 years ago, I started something called Operation Respect. That has a program which is social emotional learning using music. Why? To get schools to be like the high school of music and art. And it's elementary school and in, it, it's, in all, it's all over the world, in Israel, it's in 70% of the schools, both Arabic and Jewish. And it's used not only to, uh, to, to quell animosities and acting out and bullying, it's also to cool out the spikes that occur when there is conflict. And it's, it's in 22,000 schools here. So my experience is that if we don't focus on our humanity, our values, in terms of, you say whose values, okay, our, our ethical perspective that embraces the idea that we are one, that we participate in each other's survival and lives, we're stuck. We're really fiddling while Rome is burning. Now, we can have a discussion because the lecture is over. <laughs> well, that was a terrific lecture. Thank you. Um, I guess my only follow-up question to that, and I do respect the work that you're doing in all these schools, my question is what could the university sector do mm. aside, or perhaps they should encourage more refugee students to come to their campuses. What do you think universities ought to do? Well, none of the solutions that we're talking about, for instance, uh, you know, there is the uh, carbon mitigation, you know, and, uh, and, that's, and, and the re, the capturing of the carbon so it doesn't go, and there's a lot of their terms. That's, that's one side of it, but that's, that kind of uh, slows down the process that is inevitable unless some breakthrough in science allows us to uh, regenerate uh, to ca capture more carbon than, you know, so that we are on an inverse path. What needs to happen is not something tiny. It's not, look, uh, like, uh, take out, separate your garbage, or, you know, yeah, don't drink with a, a plastic straw. I'm not saying that that isn't significant. I'm saying that at the colleges and universities, what needs to be, in all the teachers' colleges, the entire perspective has to shift from what was the, uh, the, uh, the no child left behind point of view that changed when ESA, Elementary and Secondary School Act, changed um, in, in the last year of Obama. And we were very much a part of it. And it was changed a little bit, but it's not enough. We have to say, being educated today is educating our ethic and our heart. And colleges, you know, and, and I'm going to try what I can, they have to turn out teachers that have this perspective. And that everybody who is going to, to college now has to be accepting of the fact that there has to be a spiritual growth within them. We have to say, unless we are able to be unselfish, to love one another, 
unless we're able to be empathetic to one another, we're not going to make it. And that's a comprehensive change. But first people have to, you know, uh, there was a small percentage of people at this point that were in the United States, in the, uh, in, in the uh, 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 impeachment of Richard Nixon. Small, below 20%. And it wasn't long before it occurred. There is a kind of a tipping point reality. And you have to say, how do we get to that point? How did we get to that point in the civil rights movement? How does that happen? It happens as the grass, at the grassroots. Look about the change in the, uh, in the perspective on uh, uh, same gender marriage and acceptance of fluid sexuality. There was no Abraham Lincoln with a new proclamation, you know, of, uh, of equity. It happened because people lived it. It must be done at the grassroots. It, the, you don't do an anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam no war movement from the top down. You, you do it from the grassroots up and then you acquire the kind of strength uh, that, so that the, uh, the tops down begins to be a part of it. So. If anybody can take the lead in doing this, the people, teachers are not teachers because they want to make a fortune. They are there because they want to serve, because they are filled with empathy. Peter, thank you so much for coming. Thank on you, show. my brother. Thank you. Yeah. If you'd like additional information about Peter Yarrow, please visit PeterYarrow.net. If you would like to send an email to me at the show, please do so at HigherEducationToday at TopColleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.